So I'm off camera for the moment. Um, there's a blank board. Uh, if you are away today, um, I was just castigating everyone, you know, with the importance of time management and yada, yada, yada. Um, the reality is we don't have a lot of time. Gabby and Kristen are not focused. Uh, I need them to be. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of things today. Um, and, and we're having a look at some things. Um, <clears throat> the things that we need to be covering are themes, characterization, symbolism, and motifs. I feel like we've done that pretty well. I feel like we're on top of that pretty well. I feel like you're able to respond pretty well to those things. The things that we haven't really looked at as much are the representations of social class and power, the invited reading and reader positioning. So, um, if we look today... Um, if you're watching from home, I apologise. Uh, I can't get this data projector to work. There is a PowerPoint that goes with this. I will make it available to you through S Drive uh, and probably also the Learning Place. But at this stage, we're just going to old school it. Um, so representations of power, stru uh, power, social power and societal structure. Um, Invited readings, and finally, um, so these are three things that I don't feel like we've adequately covered. These are, are things that I really want us to, to look at, but I don't feel like we've done it. Um, I also need to... Uh, talk about privileging values, beliefs, and ideologies. Obviously, that's going to come into invited reading, but... And then we're going to have a crack at writing some thesis statements. Now, we did have a look at... Uh, Natalia, your new glasses are on point. You look amazing. No, don't be ridiculous. They look fabulous. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were going to have that reaction. I thought they looked great. Um, for those of you playing at home, I just embarrassed Natalia and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I thought she looked amazing. Um, representations of social power and societal structure. So, in the novel 1984, and I am sorry for those of you trying to follow along while I've got the camera running, there's just no happy medium here until they agree to give me my own room with a permanently ceiling-mounted camera, which will happen after you guys have left. Um, <clears throat> so, representations of social power, I feel like we're pretty good with. We understand that 1984 is a reaction to Marxism. Uh, we know that it's a reaction against totalitarian governments, and we know that Orwell believed that uh, particularly Lenin had betrayed the socialist ideas of Marx and Engel. Is everyone okay with those concepts? If you don't know what I'm talking about, now is a super double plus good opportunity to ask me. Nope. All right. So um, we're seeing a direct reaction to Stalinism, Leninism, uh, the rise of the communist um, movement, uh, even Churchill's England and the jingoistic... Um, fever that gripped England post-war. Uh, post and 
we're looking at this representation of the party members and those who are not. Okay, so we see that the proles, the proletariat, are the ones that slip through the cracks. Very similar to um, Lord of the Flies, they're the little ones. They're the ones that the government doesn't give a jack's cracker about. So they <coughs> exist within society, <coughs> but are so far out of the privileged hierarchy that they might as well not exist in society. Does that make sense to everyone? So the proletariat are the vast majority of the population of Airstrip 1. Probably somewhere between 70 and 80% of Airstrip 1 is actually made up of proles. Maybe that's too high. We don't ever get... Do they? It actually says 80-85%? There you go. Um, go me. But maybe I shouldn't have admitted to, you know, guessing. But it is, a, it is a staggeringly high number of the population or a staggeringly high percentage of the population that is um, the, the proletariat, the, the unwashed masses, um, who have no control over the way society is run. The next social class are the party members, the outer party members. <clears throat> this is Winston, Julia, the, um, the woman, the, the cabbage woman, I can never remember her name. Mrs. Parsons. Mrs. Parsons, Mr. Parsons, their awful, awful children. Um, these are the people who are part of the party. They are members of the party, but they still have no power within society. Everyone sees this, that they are actually no better off than the proles, and in many ways they are less well off than the proles, because at least the proles can do whatever they like without fear of repercussion or recursion. Um, <clears throat> then we've got the inner party, which is the oligarchy or the, the ruling elite, who have all the control, set all the rules, reap all the benefits that the junior party or the outer party don't have. So we can see a fairly clear parallel between um, the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels and even, um, <clears throat> even 1948... Uh, or post-war Britain um, during the in the post-war recovery there was a toxic smog cloud went through London and thousands upon thousands <coughs> of commoners died from air pollution okay because they didn't have adequate glazing in their houses they didn't have glass windows they couldn't keep the fog out, and out of the, the wealthy, you know, so we've got the haves and the have-nots, it's just, it, it's a story as old as capitalism itself, um, those, you know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the ones in the middle get stuck holding, you know, get stuck bearing the weight of, you know, society's disparate nature. Um, <clears throat> so the invited reading here is... Well, let, let's throw it to the floor. What's the invited reading? What is the one thing George Orwell wants us to take away from 1984? He asked the question. He never does that. He just talks at us. <laughs> nope. Um, I guess to educate people what we're going through right now. So, um... So Grace has made a good point. To educate people about what we're going through right now. Orwell didn't know what, but it's a warning. Yeah. It's an allegorical warning. So you're absolutely nailing it in terms of Orwell was saying, and he predicted pretty accurately mm. what will be or what today is. We're not very far off 
Big Brother. I mean, we yeah. we are, but we're not. Um, you know, we're not all ruled by Big Brother. We don't all have mandatory vices, but we kind of take them voluntarily. You know, Orwell predicted an oppressive crushing regime because that's what he lived through. Mm. Like, he lived through the Nazi, not that he was in Germany, but, you know, he, he went and shot, you know, he did the Spanish Revolution, he lived through World War One. he lived through World War Two. He he saw the oppressive hand of government at every turn. And he saw people being ground down, their identities, their humanity, being eroded by the strength of totalitarian government. And so that was the vision that he had for our reality. But now it's like we're unconsciously... Yeah, that's right. So we are just as oppressed as Winston, but we choose it. You know, we actually invite what he saw as abuses, Mm -hmm. we see as choices. Um, So, you know, there there is... The the outworking of it is slightly different, Mm -hmm. but the effect of it is the same. Um, You know, um, so the invited reading is an allegorical warning. He's saying to us, don't get caught in this trap that I see before you. And it's not even a warning to us. It's a warning to our grandparents, to our parents, to the generations past. In one sense, we're already there. But there is still a warning for us because it hasn't yet turned into oppression But it seems liable, it seems viable that it might. You know, that with the threat of nuclear war or whatever, it it seems feasible that a leader might put in place, and already there are laws in place in this country and in America which allow the circumvention of justice, of, of the law. Under certain situations, in terms of, um, uh, I, I see you. I'll get to you. Yeah. Um, oh, just hands down is okay. I'll, I'll remember you. Um, so you know, there are certain situations where, under threat of terror, the normal laws of Australia can be bypassed by the government. There are laws in America that can put the entire country, the basis of democracy on hold indefinitely if the ruling party decides that it's necessary. Does everyone see where I'm... And they've got the power of the military to back them. You know, which is an interesting... I mean, it... it, On one hand, we go, yes, but terrorism, we need to be protected from it, but... Yeah. What happens when the decision is made that, you know, in in Russia, you know, gays and lesbians are openly persecuted by the state. State State-backed militia groups are, um, in the lead-up to the Sochi Olympics, uh, a Russian punk band called Pussy Riot, um, who have an interesting name, also interesting songs... Um, they formed. A, they did a protest in Sochi, and an armed militia who were armed by the Russian government and who Putin actually openly supports came in and bashed the members of Pussy Riot within an inch of their life. Permanent disfigurement stuff. How long until a a political party decides? <clears throat> I mean, yeah. I mean the the pendulum is swinging the other way in this country. Yeah. But you know, when a political party decides that gays are the enemy of the of the state, or Muslims are the enemy of the straight of the state, or Christians are the enemy of the state, how long until 
a government decides that a particular group is dangerous and uses the powers meant for protection for persecution. I, it's just there, there's questions there for us still in this novel. How are we positioned? So I think invited readings are government control is bad, technology is dangerous, individualism is the cornerstone of democracy. Um, sorry? Um, yeah, I, I think all of those things are important. Um, Jared, you had a, a point. Yeah, so I think I finally understand the book. Is it that, in I know this sounds stupid, but is it in capitalist societies, when war happens, the government can use that as an excuse to create a totalitarian regime? Is that what it means? And that can go on indefinitely, and using the threat of war, they can then control the entire population. That is one of the key messages. Okay. Um, so... Jared's point, if you're playing along at home, um, is that um, that in a capitalist economy or a capitalist society, where there is the threat of war, the government is able to use that as a means of creating a totalitarian or an oppressive governmental model. Um, and then because war never goes away they're able to extend indefinitely the, the conditions that allowed them to take government. And the answer is, frankly, yes. That, that is what is happening. Um, Orwell wasn't specifically talking about capitalist governments, <laughs> although he was because he was English. Yeah. So he was talking about England. The British government. <clears throat> That's right. He was talking about the UK. He was also just talking about all societies, totalitarian, socialist, communist, capitalist. He was just r raging against the injustices of totalitarianism. So not necessarily just capitalist. No, but his context was capitalist, so you're absolutely right. That e even though he was talking broader than capitalist societies, he was talking about capitalist societies. Because that's his experience. We talk about the things that we know. Um, so, you know, there is just a, a degree of that. Um, and he is positioning us to, you know, to fear government control. He's positioning us to fear um, totalitarianism. He's positioning us to, to mistrust the government. Um, you know, to not put blind faith in the government. Um, in terms of privileging particular values, beliefs, and ideologies, well, I, I think we've really just covered that. Um, you know, he is pro-socialist, anti-totalitarianist. Um, um, he, he believes in the, the rights of the individual for the good of the many. Okay? Where every person should have freedom of expression and freedom of identity in a way which benefits society. So it's not about self-promotion. It's about the good of everyone, but how quickly that gets perverted. That pure ideology of socialism gets perverted into what's good for the country is for you to not have rights. Okay, um, because you know we've seen the failed communist experiments, the failed socialist experiments, where you know everybody uh, is equal until people aren't, mm -hmm. and you know I don't think it's I, I don't think it's any secret that you know as soon as human beings get involved, you know um, there's an old um, there's an old maxim from World War Two. Um, no plan survives contact with the enemy, no ideal survives contact with humans. Um, you know, it, it, it just is. Um, I thought what we might do now, and I know how exciting, how exciting, 
how excited people are. Um, <clears throat> I had a bunch of stuff that I wanted to put up as PowerPoints. I'm going to do that tomorrow when we move back into our classroom because I don't want to write it all out by hand. Um, that, that would not be fun. Um, I'm just going to give you... I, I gave you a thesis to look at the other day. I don't know whether we ended up finishing it. Did we? I gave you a question. You had to write a thesis. I don't know whether we did that or not. I don't... I know you didn't. Um, roll your eyes at me. Did you? Yes. Oh, so indignant. I'm sorry. I apologise. That was a perfect eye roll. I loved it. No, I'm being really unreasonable, aren't I? Um, yeah, so th there was, I, I don't know, expression, and I misread it. I apologise. Um, do we want to go through those theses that we looked at? Do, have people got them? Do we want to talk about them? I think it's a good idea. Um, this is not going to be great on video, but... Possibly it's worth doing anyway. Um, so, Willow, would you like to kick us off? Uh, not at all. Not at all, okay. Did it, don't want to share it, that's fine. Um, Anna also said yes, so we'll go with her. I uh, know, I said yes to what you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, let's try again. If you want to share your thesis, share your thesis, and if you don't... Yeah, if you want me to provide commentary on your thesis... Now's the time to do it. I don't remember what the question was. It was probably genius. Can somebody remind me? To what extent can George Orwell's 1949 novel 1984 be considered an allegorical text? Justify your position making specific reference to the text, its themes, and the literary devices used by the author? It's a stupidly long question. Some idiot wrote that. Um... <clears throat> To what extent can George Orwell's novel 1984 be considered an allegorical text? <coughs> Justify your position with evidence. Would have been astronomically easier. Um, who is willing to share their thesis and have me comment on it? Nobody. That's what you get for asking for volunteers, huh? A reasonable. <laughs> You'll read somebody else's. Sounds so helpful. Uh, if anyone wants Kyle to read theirs, just pass it to him now. People are thinking about it, but no. All right. So, no, you didn't do it for nothing. We'll read it then. We'll give it to him. Okay, we're, we're burning video time. Let's just get it done. George Orwell's novel 1984 can successfully be considered an allegorical text because of the author's manipulation of symbolism, characterization, and allegorical literacy themes that portray the dystopian world. Orwell's literary construction of the prevalent social power in British society at the time portrays a dystopian future that compels the audience to form a political critique of the present. <laughs> there were air quotes. Oh, tell us screens are used as allegorical symbolism of the government's omnipresence throughout the book, while a totalitarian and the totalitarian political system is implemented to override any possibility of uprising. Okay, I'm just going to stop there. I Anna, think it was two sentences. <laughs> I think the first part, right up until you start going into telly screens are a symbol of, yeah. was fantastic. As a as a thesis, I think it really works. Don't go into giving your examples in your thesis. Don't. Don't give your examples. Save them for your paragraph on symbolism um, and imagery. Don't, you know, don't go into that level of detail. You definitely gave examples in your thesis. I, I did, but not at that level. Um, so, um, I, I just think it's... How many words is it? Can you do a word count for me? Feels like it was up around the 80, 85 word mark. 
It feels long. It's literally like two sentences. Then you need some more punctuation in there. <laughs> this is why people don't get the thesis in the exam. No, but you have to. It's... Anna's on a Mac, so therefore can't easily find out how many words. 84 words. 84 words. It's almost like I said, it was between 80 and 85. So, you know. All right. <coughs> Feeling good about that one. Um, anyone else want me to savage theirs while I'm going? You're good at guessing today, sir. I'm on fire. Um, seriously, I'm feeling pretty great about life. Um, I'm not trying again, because Kristen will do it. Excellent. In your big girl voice. She doesn't have a man voice. She has a man face. It's different. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> I'm the worst. And that's on camera too. Yeah, no, no, I. That's pretty bad. I acknowledge that I am the worst. <laughs> and I apologise to Kristen, who has a lovely lady face. Yeah. Defamation. Oh, it's only defamation. Just. Oh. Now Willow is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I. <laughs> okay. We appreciate you. Can we Kristen. just, like. Stop insulting me. Yes. Can I just Throughout his 1949 novel, 1984, author George Orwell presents a compelling allegorical analysis and criticism of the power dynamics that encompassed a post-war British society, and in doing so examines the threat of totalitarian... Totalitarian regimes. 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 <laughs> self-actualization and its dangers alike, the imminent threat of war and independent thought amidst government control. A, I feel like Bianca was channeling her mother then very strongly. Will you stop fidgeting with that young lady? Um, secondly, that was amazing. Um, do that on the day. Um, I actually don't think there's much criticism to be had there, which is why I front-loaded it. Regimes, right? Except for not saying regimes, right. I, resume. Resume, regimen, I don't know. Resume. Uh, resume. Um, so, <laughs> look, luckily you can write, because that was pretty clear. I don't think there's too much to say about that. Um, I think words-wise it was probably pretty good. I'm not going to guess again. Um, but it was fantastic. I liked it. Um, anyone else? Follow those two, why don't you? Go, Bianca. I think Bianca just volunteered. Kristen volunteered you. You volunteered her. It's only fair. She said already she wanted to do it. She did. I said, should I do it? And then you said, Kristen. No, you're like, I'm going to do it. I don't want to pass Kyle will. Kyle will do it? Excellent. Kyle. 